Today is the third Sunday of Advent. A gospel text is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 2 through 11. John the Baptist is to the fore once again. Before I reflect on John the Baptist and his role, I'd like to make two observations by way of a preface to my reflection. First of all, I found in reflecting on this gospel that somehow or other the idea of being in the presence of mystery was more powerful than normal. That words cannot say what I was intuiting, what I think is there. However, I must use words, and I will use words. Which brings me to the second point, namely, I will refer to my written texts more than I usually do to keep me on track. I'm mindful of a comment that Merton made, passing on an observation by a Sufi mystic whom he met in 1966, who said, what is best cannot be said, cannot be spoken. I'd invite you to listen for what is not said here. Listen with the ear of the heart. Because I think... John the Baptist, when I say this, it seems so obvious, but John the Baptist points to the ultimate mystery, the incarnation, the enfleshing of God. And that struck me more powerfully, just that simple truth, than I've ever thought of it before. I hope I can convey something of that in this reflection. So we meet John the Baptist here for the second time. The first time was on the, at the River Jordan when he's baptizing people, including Jesus. The next time, it's about his execution by Herod. The next time, the third, the fourth time, is when Jesus asks the disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And John the Baptist's name comes up. And then finally, there's the transfiguration, where the prophet Elijah, Elijah appears, and Jesus says, in fact, John the Baptist is the prophet, the reappearance of the Elijah figure. We cannot imagine John the Baptist without Jesus. Nor can we imagine Jesus without John the Baptist. Their lives and their teaching are absolutely intertwined. Each invites us to think of the other. John the Baptist, Jesus says, there is none arisen greater than John the Baptist. However, he adds, anybody in the kingdom, the lowest member of the kingdom, is greater than John. My intuition here is that what John points to in being a messenger of the Incarnation is in fact the being in the flesh of God which invites us to reflect on our own human being in the flesh. The dignity of the human person derived, as it is, from the Incarnation, God's Incarnation, our Incarnation, our being in the flesh. Dr. Anna Rowlands, St. Hilda Associate Professor of Catholic Thought and Practice at Durham University in the United Kingdom, speaks beautifully of the way the Incarnation opens up, points to, enables us to contemplate the dignity of being a human being, of being in the flesh. She actually calls on the thought of Joseph Ratzinger, later Pope Benedict. Let me quote the words of Anna Rowland. Christ comes to renew in us our call to recognize ourselves as persons. 
the incarnation performs a distinctly pedagogical function. However, to grasp what Christ has to teach requires us to remember that Christ is not a creature of exception, a crude superhero figure, but rather the fulfillment of what God intends for the human person. The new and the final Adam set amongst us, set before us. In this sense, Christ opens up space, the space of his own body, in and through which it is possible for us to gather in a new way as persons on the way to life in the Father. I must confess that typically over the years I've seen John the Baptist as the messenger. He points to Jesus and then we all turn and listen to Jesus, his teaching. I've never been so aware that John the Baptist, who is a person being in the flesh, points to the epitome of personhood, of being in the flesh, personhood, that Jesus represents. God being in the flesh is a reminder to us of the dignity of our own personhood, of our also being in the flesh. It's good for us to ask the question then, in the light of this, who am I? And indeed, what am I? In faith, a faith in God being in the flesh, the incarnation, prompts us to answer the question, who am I? With something like, I am an embodied word of love spoken to the world a unique embodied word of love. My being in the flesh unites me with Jesus being in the flesh, God's being in the flesh. What am I? I am a unique place where God enters the world my being in the flesh is a sacrament of God's saving mystery. Worth remembering that in the thinking of the Old Testament, and here I quote Aylward Squire from his marvellous book, Asking the Fathers, he says, in the thinking of the Old Testament, personality is an animated body, not an incarnate soul. Greek thinking has very, very heavily influenced Christian thought, more so perhaps than Hebrew thinking. And there's a world of difference between thinking of ourselves as animated bodies, a being in the flesh, an animated being in the flesh, rather than being incarnate souls. Consider the words of St. Paul. 1 Corinthians, chapter 6. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? That your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Glorify God in your body.